Genesis chapter number 10. We're going to be, begin reading in verse number 1. Genesis 10 obviously isn't a very meaty chapter, but there are, of course, still things that can be learned from Genesis chapter number 10. Is it focuses on the genealogies of the three sons of Noah. And that's how it begins here in verse number 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then it tells us, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Medaiah, and Medea, I'm sorry, Medea, and Jabin, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiraz. Now I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter number 27. Ezekiel chapter number 27. A lot of these names we're going to be doing cross-references on. Tonight's sermon is going to be a little bit shorter than usual. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter number 27, but we're going to be cross-referencing some of these, and this is going to show you know, that there are still things to be learned, as I mentioned already, from genealogies throughout the Bible. There are many things to be, to be learned. The first time when you read through uh, chapters on just strictly genealogies, it can be very boring, and a lot of the names are very foreign to you. They're very uh, unknown to you. But when you, the more you read the Bible, the more you start to identify who these specific people are and how they are to be related in certain stories within the Bible. Now, in verse number two, there are a list of names. We're not going to go through all of the names that were mentioned, but there are a few lists throughout Ezekiel, right around the end of chapter 20 and the end of chapter 30, where these names show up. Some of the names are here at this verse we're going to look at, and some are not, but they're actually in Ezekiel 30. So that's interesting that this one verse, where these people are located, of course, has almost every name in it in just those few chapters, and in specifically the book of Ezekiel. So look at Ezekiel chapter 27, verse number 13. I want to show you this. Ezekiel chapter number 27, verse number 13. It says this, Javon and Tubal and Meshach, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. Then if you go to verse number 14, they of the house of Togarma traded in thy fairs with horses and horsemen and mules. The men of Dedan were thy merchants. Many isles were the merchandise. It goes on, you skip down to verse number uh, 19. Dan also and Javan going to and fro occupied in thy fairs. So you notice it was about four names roughly that were mentioned in uh, Verse number 2 of Genesis chapter number 10. The reason being because when families spread out throughout the Bible and even, even now, just historically in general, this is how humans operate. They like to be close to their family. So one family will move and another family will ultimately relocate to that location. So my family, uh, as far as the Baker side of my family... They, were, they lived in the Appalachian Mountains for many generations, like almost four generations, which is, which is quite a while to stay in one location. My father's line. My uh, father, or my, or my grandfather, my father's father, he relocated from the Appalachian Mountains, and then just a few years after that, his brother moved and did not plan on moving, but because he wanted to be close to his brother. I believe that it was just those two particularly that were live, living close to each other at that time, it, during that time at, in the Appalachian Mountains. So that's why. Families just like to stick together. So the reason why these countries are being mentioned much later on, and there were countries at that time, is because when these men went out, these brothers, they founded land all by one another. You know, three nations, four nations, or whatever it may be that we're discussing. And then they started this, these countries, these tribes at that time when they were a smaller stage. And then they stayed there, and those lands became known as that. We'll see that a couple more times here. I want you to look at verse number three. <laughs> Some of these names are going to be familiar. Another name that would have been familiar in verse number two, which is mentioned in, like, I believe, Ezekiel chapter 37 or 38, was Magog. Of course, Gog and Magog, when it's referencing the end times, right? Look there at verse number three. It says, And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togarma. Now, if you remember, Togarma was also mentioned in one of those verses we just read in Ezekiel. So notice, a lot of these, that's another one. A lot of these are mentioned, brought up only in that one location, Ezekiel 27, because it's referring to a specific area that became known of that. Gomer is also mentioned here. The only time I believe that Gomer is used outside of this in the Bible, you can check me on this, is Hosea's wife. He went and took the wife Gomer, and I don't believe that it may be, it might not even be used again. Besides that, but you can look that up. And I, I encourage you to do a study on these names yourself so that you can uh, become familiar with who these people were and where they landed 
Notice Ashkenaz is, is mentioned there as well. Brother Russell brought this up to me a year ago. He noticed that this was in the Bible. You know, just like, uh, you know, we talk about the, uh, is it just Ashkenaz? Ashkenazi? Ashkenazi, just an I that, that makes the E sound. Ashkenazi is a, a sect of the Jews, of course. So Ashkenaz is mentioned there, and I'm sure that that's related in some way or, the, or another. Verse number four, the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanum. Now, Tarshish is mentioned. Does anybody know where Tarshish is mentioned prominently? Very popular. Where? The kings. Uh, well, that's not what I was thinking of. Maybe it's mentioned there as well. I'm thinking of somewhere else. That could be another mention of it. Does anybody know? It should be real obvious. Anybody? Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. That's that. Tarsus. That's Tarsus. So that, that could be in the New Testament. I bet it's, it could very possibly be the same thing. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Tarsus is where Jonah, remember he flees unto Tarshish, and he gets the fair. He goes to, uh, he wants to go to Joppa, but he has to go to Tarshish in order to catch a fair to Joppa. I believe his ultimate destination is Joppa, but it's one or the other. But that's Tarshish is where that pops into my mind when, when uh, I read Tarshish there. Look at verse number five. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nation. So we can see here that the sons of Javan, one of them, one of them was Tarshish. Now, Javan was a direct descendant of uh, Japheth, just a couple down the line, was Tarshish. So that's interesting that the man Tarshish was just three gener or two generations away from Japheth, and then he's found in the city. So when it's referencing that, you know, many, many years later, when Jonah's traveling, it's actually one of Japheth's grandsons. So that's interesting. When you keep track of this stuff, that's what that land ended up being named after. So this was the, the land that the Gentiles <coughs> were divided in. These are the heathen. Remember, Gentile means heathen. So these are men that ended up not serving the Lord, of course. Not getting saved and not serving the Lord. Look at verse number 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Foot and Canaan. So there's uh, Ham's son, as we read in the last chapter. It tells us in verse number 22 and 18 of 9 that Ham was the father of Canaan. Verse 7. And the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah. And Sapta and Rehamah and Saptika and the sons of Rehamah, Sheba and Dedan. Now, Havilah was mentioned in Genesis chapter number 2. It was talking about the river of Pison. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it encompasses the land of Havilah. P Pison, that river, went around, all the way around the land of Havilah. That's where that was mentioned. And see how, you know, that's, a, that's an example of how this Bible study can be you know, profitable to us when we read those two chapters close enough that are pointed out that we can see you know, it mentioned elsewhere. You may not have even noticed that in your daily Bible reading. Look at uh, verse number 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Look at verse number 9. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, Nimrod is like the trigger word for all the YouTube conspiracy theorists, people, isn't it? They all want to talk about just Nimrod and Babel and Babylon. Nimrod <coughs> is hardly, hardly talked about at all. Nimrod is mentioned here, and then a lot of these names are also mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter number 1. Almost the same exact list is mentioned here. And the same list, if you, if you remember Genesis 5, is our genealogies as well. So Genesis 5 and Genesis 10 are also found in 1 Chronicles 1. So Nimrod is mentioned here. He's mentioned in, uh, he's mentioned in the book of Micah, where it refers to the land of Nimrod. And then he's mentioned, like I said already, in 1 Chronicles 1. And all it does is just say the land of Nimrod in Micah. And then in 1 Chronicles 1, it's just the same genealogy as this. It just says Nimrod. And then look back at verse number 8. So we're going to read verse 8 and 9. And this is all, these are all the details we get of Nimrod. This is all that it says. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be, <coughs> excuse me, a mighty one in the earth. Verse number 9. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, Nimrod is likened unto Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to show you why in just a moment, why people say that. But he's likened unto Nebuchadnezzar. He's likened unto the Antichrist. 
Nimrod is like, he's got like the worst rap of like any of these people that were ever looked at as being some sort of emperor or anything like that. Every conspiracy theorist of the New World Order ties in with Nimrod in some way or the other. Like, if you look on YouTube, it's insane. Everybody wants to go back. There's hardly any information that's mentioned about Nimrod. Go watch one video on Nimrod and the New World Order and, and analyze the amount of Bible verses that are used or what Bible verses that are used and pay close attention on how they're twisting things and adding to God's Word because that's really what it comes down to. And a lot of times when people want to build up these huge conspiracy arguments or whatever they are, these conspiracy theories, it's based upon almost no Bible. It's just people that are just interested in conspiracies. They're just interested in end times Bible prophecy. There's enough end times Bible prophecy here that we can just study and read. It's all the people that are like, you know, and learn from that. The people that are always real big into this never use the Bible. And it's sad. There should be more people out there that are like really interested in end times Bible prophecy that are like, hey, let's look at Revelation. Hey, let's look at Daniel. Let's actually study things that the Bible tells us. Why not just go after what the Bible says? Why not just use, there's so much information here already. Why just start adding to God's word and making up your own theories? You know why? Because it's a lot of work to read the Bible. You know why? Because tonight's sermon is on Genesis chapter number 10. And you know what people don't like to do? Read Genesis chapter number 10. What they don't like to do is read 1 Chronicles chapter 1 through chapter 9. They don't like to read the entirety of the Bible. And you know what? It's a lot of work to study the Bible. The Bible tells you that. You know, the Bible talks about how much study is weariness to the flesh. What's reading of books? The Bible talk calls you know, the man that studies the Bible a workman. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. If you want to teach Bible prophecy, then study the Bible. Study the Bible. Just use what you have here. Don't just dream up some conspiracy on Nimrod. I personally don't think that Nimrod looks like that bad of a guy. Nimrod is mentioned here, and he's actually the Lord is brought up. You know what it says is look closely at verse, so first, verse number eight, it tells you that he began to be a mighty one in the earth. So he's strong. He obviously has probably some sort of political power before there really are a, a, you know, deep you know, rooted societies or civilizations, right? He began to be a mighty one in the earth. And then it says in verse nine, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So why did he bring up the Lord there? You notice that? It says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. There's nothing negative about that in particular, is there? So why specifically bring up the Lord? Maybe it's, it could be saying this, that maybe even before the Lord, God considered him looking at all the men that he was a mighty hunter. Just to validate the statement. But a lot of times when you look up before the Lord, it's in reference to someone's like relationship with God. Like someone walks before the Lord or something along those lines. Like when it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, it says that the men of Sodom were sinners or were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So notice it's like their relationship before the Lord, like how God looks at them. Well, God looks at Nimrod and it doesn't mention that he's a sinner before the Lord exceedingly, does it? That's who we need to be preaching against is, is Sodom. Not Nimrod, poor guy, it's hardly mentioned at all. Right. You know, we need to look at the Bible. The Bible says that, that Sodom, that the men of Sodom were sinners and wicked before the Lord exceedingly, or wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So take the things in the Bible that are just written in the Bible. Just take, use the Bible. Don't add to God's word. Don't dream up your own theories. I'm 100% honest. I'm not interested in, in talking to you about the Bible if you're just going to use your own interpretation. I have zero interest in that. I actually want to know the truth of the Bible. I don't want to watch some guy who's just trying to make the Bible in his way interesting. The Bible's interesting to me just how it is. I don't need to add to it. I love it how it is. I mean that for the bottom of my heart. So just read the Bible. Don't put your twist on it. Just read it for what it is. There's enough here. And you know what you'll do? You'll fall in love with the Bible. You'll start to see how great and how powerful and how majestic the Bible is. You couldn't make the Bible any better than it is. The Bible is amazing how it is. It could not be improved upon. So you just need to learn to love it how it is. And you know what will happen is then your eyes will be open and you'll understand the greatness of God's word. That's what will happen. So notice here it says that he is a mighty hunter before the Lord. So it's interesting that the Lord is mentioned. And then it says 
even as Nimrod, this is what people say, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So people say this as well, that he's the mighty hunter before the Lord. Why would they mention the Lord? To me, honestly, I don't think there's any way to get around that he is in some way acknowledging God. People are saying he's a mighty, if he was like worshiping Baal, what would, what would they say? He's a mighty hunter before Baal, right? They would identify him with his God, right? Well, to me, when I read this, it makes me think that he is a mighty hunter before the Lord because he acknowledges God in some sense. Now, I don't know if he's saved or not. There's no way of telling you. There's not enough information that's given. But that is definitely a possibility because it tells you he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. People are saying that. Look at verse 10. Now we're going to get into why people dream up these weird you know, theories that are really not... They're not really based upon anything. <coughs> so it says in uh, verse number 10, the beginning of his kingdom. So he obviously became a king. And like I mentioned, he was mighty. So he had a lot of power politically. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Chaldee. And then it says this, in the land of Shinar. Now Babel there... <coughs> is referring to like Babylon. It comes from like Babylon. The way you can tell that is, let's go, we'll, we'll look at it real quick. Go to Daniel chapter number one. This is one of the only mentions. You know, when things are mentioned only a few times, it's easy to remember where they are. So Dan, if you remember, Daniel chapter number one actually tells you where, it, where everything is taking place with Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel chapter number one, right after the major prophets there, Daniel chapter number one, the very beginning of the chapter, oftentimes the Bible will do this, it, does the, it also does the same in the book of Esther. It'll tell you where this is taking place. So look at Daniel chapter number one, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. Then watch what it says which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. Now, where did Nebuchadnezzar dwell? What, 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 is it, what is it called? He's the king of what? Of Babylon. But notice what that land, so that's the name of his kingdom is Babylon, but notice what that land is referred to. When they carry everything away, the vessels, because if you remember when they retrieved the vessels after this, they were located where the king was located. So it's not carried to an alternate location. It's carried to Babylon, the, the kingdom of Babylon. But what's the land called? Shinar. What was it called? He said he was the, of the kingdom of Babel, referring to Nimrod. That comes from Babylon. It comes from the same word of Babylon actually comes from Babel. And it comes from, as we're going to see in a minute, when God confounded the languages. What it, you know, just like what it means to babble means someone's not making sense. <clears throat> what happens when God confuses the language? It, you know, like uh, uh, we talked about the other night, Brother uh, Anthony pointed this out in the preaching class, how, uh, how when someone is speaking in another tongue, what do they sound like to you? A barbarian, right? It sounds like someone's babbling, right? So if you can't understand someone else, it just sounds like they're just babbling, right? It just sounds like noise, sounds that they're uttering, but you don't really get it. That babbling actually comes from the word babble, and it means, you know, uh, like an unknown tongue, basically, that someone is babbling because they weren't able to understand one another. So the land where Babel or Babylon was located was actually the land of Shinar. It's mentioned again in the book of Zechariah, which is talking about end times. We're not going to turn there. It's talking about end times uh, at the very uh, close, closer to the end of the book when he sees the woman with the ephod and he says, this is wickedness, this is great wickedness. It's a very confusing chapter. And then they... He, she, uh, she's relocated, it's picked up and then relocated, and it's actually uh, relocated to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the land of Shinar. That's where it's relocated. So it's mentioned again, it's talking about some sort of empire or some sort of kingdom, and it's referencing back to Babylon, which is, keep that in mind, the land of Shinar. It says in verse number 11, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, the city of Rehoboth. And Kela and reason between Nineveh and Kela, the same is a great city. Now, not a lot of people may, may know this. I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter number 19. But Nineveh is a capital city. It is the capital city of Assyria. 
It is the capital city of Assyria. If you're familiar with the kingdom of Assyria or the empire of Assyria, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Second Kings chapter number 19. Second Kings chapter number 19 is verse number 36. It should be at the very end of the chapter, I believe. Yeah. So Sennacherib, he was the king of Assyria at that time. It tells you verse 36. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned, and it tells you, and dwelt at Nineveh. And it tells you in verse number 37, and it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adrenalac and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his stead. So notice when he's fighting and he's battling, when he leaves, it says that he returns. What does it mean to return somewhere? You're going back to where you were before, right? And what does it mention? It mentions Nineveh. Notice this is his home. It says that he goes into the, ha his, the house of his God to worship his God. And it says that he, he went to Nineveh. Now you can look this up if you would be interested in it as well. And just when they, they study archaeology and things like that and history, they've, they've, they've shown in other uh, ways that the Bible is accurate that Nineveh was the capital of the empire of Assyria. That's, that's shown even just in secular history if you look it up. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. So see how a lot of these things you may not know that but these specific people that are born and it gives you their name? You can find cities thousands of years later that are relating back to them. So when you start to read in Genesis chapter number 10, when you're knowledgeable about the Bible... It's not as mind-numbing, is it? Because you're thinking about all these people. Oh, Tarshish, that's where Jonah went. You know, Nimrod, he's mentioned over here. He, it, it's also called the land of Nimrod in Zechariah 12, I believe it is. So, oh, the land of Nimrod, it's also called the land of Shinar. Oh, that's Babylon. See, when you understand what you're reading, it's not as mind-numbing. So, it should compel you to read the Bible more. That's what that should do for you. When, you, when, you're, when you're bored, it's because you're not knowledgeable about what you're reading. You understand what I'm saying? That's what's going on. When you're bored about something, it's because you don't understand what you're hearing, what you're doing. You understand what I mean by that? That's in all areas normally. In all areas. Maybe you can be, it, something can become so easy, but when someone's doing something and you're watching someone do something, a lot of times when someone's bored, it's because they're ignorant of what's going on. That's really what it is. When you're reading your Bible and you can get to a part of it where it's very boring, you might it might be that you just don't know the Bible well enough. So you need to try as hard as you can to pay attention now and keep paying attention while you're reading your Bible. And you know what will happen? It will become more interesting because you can start making connections while you're reading. So, you know, that's, that should compel you to read your Bible more. Look at, uh, look at verse number 13. Pick back up in verse number 13. And Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lehavim and Nephthim, Nephtuhim, sorry, Nephtuhim and Pathrusim and Kasluhim out of whom came Philistine. Now, you can't really verify this, but that could be a reference to, like, uh, to uh, Philistine or the Philistines or something along those lines because that, that name only comes up uh, one time. I looked it up actually just a few minutes ago when I was reading through here, and Philistine only comes up one time in the Bible right here. Yeah, so that's, I would say, probably is related in some way to the Philistines. I would almost guarantee that, but you can't, you know, from what I know so far of it, you know, unless you can make some other connection between the surrounding names or maybe where, you know, Philistine, the child of Philistine, if you can maybe find them, you can, you can study it out and you can maybe figure something out. And if you find something out, let me know about it. But uh, it says, Cain Philistine and Kephorim and Canaan, verse 15, begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. <coughs> Then verse 16, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgasite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arbadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. Now flip over to Ex uh, Exodus chapter number 33. Exodus chapter number 33. <coughs> Exodus chapter number 33. So notice that of them, of this, these groups that were mentioned, were the Canaanites spread abroad. Now, of course, you know, everyone knows of the land of Canaan, just beyond Jordan. That is, of course, the promised land that was given to Abraham. You know, uh, the land that Moses ultimately, he didn't go, get to go into, but o Moses ultimately encroached or approached unto. He died on the mountain, and then the land of Israel became the land of Israel after that. 
Now, you'll see almost uh, all of these names mentioned and a little bit of a variation. Sometimes some names are omitted and other names are added, but you'll see all of these names mentioned almost uh, uh, you know, every time that, that these nations are mentioned and they're getting ready to attack these nations or maybe it's summarizing the battles because these were the nations that were inhabiting Canaan before Israel came to that land. So look at Exodus chapter number 33. Exodus 33, the very beginning of the chapter, actually, verse number 2, it tells you, And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite. And, he's, and so that the Canaanite is just those that are living in the land of Canaan. And then he tells you the specific people. The Amorite, the Hittite, the Hittite, I'm sorry, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. And then he goes on, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So that was the promised land. The land of Canaan, where all of these nations dwell. Like I said, there'll be some variation sometimes when you read about those that were dwelling in the in the, the land of Canaan. Sometimes one nation won't be mentioned. Sometimes multiple. You know, all of the nations will be mentioned. You know, the Jebusites, if you remember, were one of the people that that uh, they didn't kill all of them, and they dwell with them. It tells you, I believe, in the book of Judges unto this day. And then even if they're mentioned again in uh, in Second uh, Samuel with David, the Jebusites are mentioned as well. When he talks about going up to uh, that particular tower and killing those people. And they say, you can't come, you're not going to be able to come into this tower. And then he comes in, you know, and he takes that land. Uh, but they, they actually lived, uh, you know, uh, concurrently with the Israelites for a period of time and served them. The Jebusites did. I believe it was the Jebusites who actually became servants. Look at uh, Genesis chapter number 10. <clears throat> Again, let's go back to verse number 19 now. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar unto Gaza, or Gaza, sometimes it will be pronounced Gaza, or Gaza. Now that is the land of the Philistines. Gaza or Gaza, now we call it Gaza, is what we, people refer to it as now, the land of Gaza. Then it says this, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboiim, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and then it says, and in their nations. So there, of course, tongues is languages. Look at verse number 21. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. Now I want you to flip over real quick to Luke chapter number 3, verse number 36, so you can see this yourself. And I'll make a couple of comparisons to something I brought up recently. Luke chapter number 3. And it's verse number 36. You'll see Shem mentioned. <clears throat> it says in verse number 36, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad. And then it says this, which was the son of Sam. Now, I mentioned this last week, how in the New Testament, when it's translated from Greek into English, it's not Shem, it's Sam. And, and this is actually a, a word that we will use to refer to the nation of Israel, those that would claim the heritage of being a Jew. We would call them a Semite. You know, oftentimes you'll hear people say you're anti-Semitic or you're an anti-Semite. They're referring to you're anti-Jewish, right? So that's what uh, Semite actually comes from, Sem, which is where we would refer to him as Shem. Normally we use the Old Testament terms when we call and speak of people that live during the Old Testament. We'll use their Old Testament name, not their New Testament name. We wouldn't say Noe and his flood, right? Noe and the flood, right? Or uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of really funny names that and some of them have a lot of variations, quite a bit of variation when you get to the New Testament like O.C., you know, from Hosea. Oh, that's a big variation, O.C. to, you know, or from Hosea to O.C. Will you, we'll refer to a person that lived in the Old Testament by their name that's translated from the Old Testament, which is Hebrew to English. So here we see it's Sim. Now, we speak English, which is a language much closer to Greek. So when there's something that we're, you know, that, that it's not us referring to it out of the Bible, but it actually evolved through our language, what language is English closer to, Greek or Hebrew? Greek, far closer to Greek, like a million times closer. They're all, Hebrew is like almost, there's almost no connection when you look at the languages. Like we, there are a lot of words that are common with Greek and English, tons of words. So... When we, so it makes sense that when we have a word to refer to the Jews today, it's not, we're not talking about you know, anything related to the Bible. 
that it would come from the Greek language. And that's why it's sem instead of shem. It's not coming from the Old Testament. Now, keep your hand right there in Luke 3. Go back to Genesis 10. I'm going to show you something else that I, that I looked at, or I'm sorry, that I mentioned last week. So if you, <coughs> you keep reading there, verse number 22, the children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram, in verse 23, and the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash, and Arphaxad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber. And that's why I'm focused on verse 25, it says, and unto Eber were born two sons. So uh, there's Eber. I mentioned that last week. Go over to <coughs> Luke chapter number 3 again. <coughs> if you remember correctly, I talked about how Eber is actually where we get the word or the name Hebrew. Right? That's another way in which we refer to the Jews. So when you, when you look back at that, Eber was a descendant of Shem. We saw that Shem's name in the New Testament was Sem. Semite, we'll refer to the Jews. You know, he's of Sem, right? And then here, it was Eber was, was the descendant of, of Shem. But if you look at verse number 35, you may or may not have noticed this. It says, uh, verse 35, we read 36, I'm sorry, 35. It says, which was the son of Serach, which was the son of Ragu, Ragu, which was the son of Balak, which was the son of Heber. Notice that? What's it getting closer and closer to? What word? Hebrew, right? And remember how I said how H's will come and go on languages, as will W's, because they're almost silent. They make a very soft sound. So, and a lot of times they are silent. There are words in which H begins the word. It is a part of the prefix, and you don't make the sound at all, very often. There are words like Hebrew where the W is there, and you don't make the sound at all, too. So the w letters like that, they'll just come and go, right? So that's how, and all that happened was, with the R was they were just, the R and the E were just transposed over time. That's just how languages change. So Sam refers to the Jews. You know, I don't have a lot to work with here in this chapter, guys, all right? So I'm teaching you something about languages a little bit. So Sam is the Semite with the Jews, right? And as is uh, Eber, which is eventually Heber, Heber in the New Testament, and became Hebrews. And that's why I refer to them as Hebrews or Sem. So they traced their genealogy all the way back to right when they got off the ark. So that's interesting that those names, the very next generation, basically. The, actually, yeah, it is the very next generation, of course, because Sem, right? Shem, they are called Semites all the way back to Noah's son. Why are you called Sem? Well, there's this guy Noah. Okay, and he got off of an ark a long time ago, and his son's name was Sem. So it's directly attached to the, you know, the flood of Noah. That's interesting. That's just a, a, such a, a, a mock story. It's made fun of today. So many people say, you're a Semite. They have no idea what that's referring to. That's actually a reference, a direct reference to the son of Noah who got off of the ark after the flood. So that's interesting when you really think about it. Look there at... <coughs> Verse number, uh, we'll read verse number uh, 20, <coughs> what was it, 5, again, one more time. So it says, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, or Peleg sometimes it's referred to as. Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. We're going to look at that in just a moment. And his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begat Almodad, and Sheleph, and Hazar Mabeth, and Jerah, and Hadoram, and Uzal. And Dikla, and Obal, Obal, I'm sorry, and Abimael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobat. All these were the sons of Joktan. The guy must have been an independent fundamental Baptist, right? Look at uh, verse number 30. And their, dwell, and their dwelling was from Misha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. And then it says in verse 31, <coughs> excuse me, these are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah. So this is the summary of this. After their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Now I want to focus on something that is a misinterpretation uh, I really like a lot of Ken Hovind's teachings on creation, but he is a particular person, and I've heard it from CRI, the Creation Research Institute. I've heard, I've actually, I have a book back there in my office that I read where they taught this, and that is on verse in verse 25, and it talks about Peleg or Peleg, as most people refer to him as. 
It says, for in his days, talk about Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. Now, a lot of times when people become overzealous to prove God's word, when, it, when uh, it comes to science, when evolution is out there in opposition to God's word and attacking things in the Bible, people are looking for things that they can use to prove Noah's flood, to prove creation. And I've heard this passage used in verse number 25, when it talks about in the days of Peleg, that for in his days, it says, was the earth divided. Now, I've heard a couple of interpretations about this. Number one, I've heard, I believe, the, I could be wrong about this, but I think it's the Creation Research Institute are the ones that teach this. They teach that that actually is one of the explanations for the fault lines, that because of you know, uh, the aftershock of the flood and the ecosystem taking such a hard hit and such a catastrophic event, the fault lines, those great earthquakes and the fault lines are you know, the result of that. Something along those lines. That was when the earth was divided, right? You know, because they, they, they try to explain it. It may not have been CRI, but I've heard it from a creation institute, right? But they try to explain science from the Bible, right? Which there are tons of science in the Bible, but sometimes, like I said, you can get overzealous. Ken Hovind teaches that this is referring to, you know, uh, the waters. You know, the waters accumulating and people dwelling. And maybe correct me if I'm wrong, if I don't explain it exactly right, if anyone else has listened to it and they know better than I do. But I believe he teaches that this is how nations ended up becoming divided, that when the waters rose after the flood... People became, became basically, they traveled from area to area. When the waters rose, they became trapped on different continents. Is that correct? Yeah, something along those lines. They became trapped on these different continents. And that's how families spread out. And that's how they became more secluded from one another. And he tried, they tried to explain genetics from this and different types of, of, of areas of science. But this is a perfect example of people that become overzealous because they love God's word. But they're not using God's word as the authority. The Bible is always our definition, right? It's always where we get our definition. It's always our dictionary, I meant to say. So it's always our dictionary. And it actually tells you right in the, right in the, the end of this chapter and in the beginning of the next what it's referring to in the earth being divided. Okay? So keep in mind, number one, this whole chapter is about genealogies, right? It's about the nation spreading about, spreading around, right? So look there again. Let's read verse number 25 one more time at the end. So you have that fresh in your mind. It says, for in his days, talking about Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And then it just tells you, and his brother's name was Jokdan. Well, look down at verse number 31. It says this. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So notice it's telling you where all these people are located, Right? Verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations and by these, look at this, were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So he's telling you that by these three, right, these three children were the nations divided as in they were separated. Right? They were divided as if you could trace their genealogy back through these three. Now, I'm going to explain further to you in the next chapter of when this division specifically took place. Look at chapter number 11, verse number 1. It says this. And the whole earth was of one what? Language, Language and one speech. Keep that in mind. Go back to verse 31. These are the sons of Shem. Now watch this. After their families, after their tongues in their lands after their nation. So what is it trying to stress to you specifically? That of this line of Shem, they have their own language, they have their own nation distinct from the others who we were speaking to, right? Speaking about just a moment ago. So he goes through the three sons and he tells you that this particular nation, in, in a roundabout way, they have their own language. This is their own nation, distinct from the other ones. But notice in chapter 11, verse 1, the whole earth is of one language. You know why? The Bible often does this. It gives you this genealogy, and then it backs up. And then it starts talking about right when they got off the ark. Do you think Noah and his three sons all spoke? Did they all speak one language? Well, when they got right off the ark, right? right. 
So notice later on they did it. They divided. They were secluded in ways, right? And they all spoke a different language, right? Well, if you're familiar with Genesis chapter number 11, this is like I referenced just a moment ago. I alluded to the story of the Tower of Babel where they're all of one language and they're all building a tower. Now, we're going to be reading this next week, so I don't want to focus on it too much, right? And, and, and then not have anything to preach next week. So the story of Babel is where everyone you know, is gathered together. The whole earth is of one language. They're gathered together, and they say, you know, uh, go to, let us get brick, and come together. We're going to build us a tower that reaches unto heaven, right? I don't believe, I've heard many people say this. I, maybe you, you believe this, but I think it's foolish. I don't believe that they meant to heaven where God is. I believe they meant to the sky. That's what I believe that they're saying. To the clouds. They're looking up. They're like, I want to build a tower to heaven. I don't think they're saying, like, I'm going to go all the way to where God dwells. I think they're just saying to the sky. Where the clouds are huge so that we can make a name for ourselves is the point. Not so that we can go visit God. It's so we can make a name for ourselves so that everybody can see it. Everybody that's close enough and around here it'll, will become renowned. Right? Which I do believe that it is definitely a picture of people trying to work their way to heaven, of course. But it's not, a, you know, it's, it's figurative of that, right? So when they do this, God then, he confounds their languages. You know, he sends the Holy Spirit down and he, he causes all of them to speak a different language. So notice they're all of one language and then all of a sudden they're all speaking di distinct languages because of this miraculous work of God. Because he does not want man to come together. And I'll go into that later, right? Uh, next week. So they're all separated, and then they're all, they all go forth in their own nation, of their own tongue. And you know what caused it to happen? You know what that caused to happen? The earth to be divided. Because in what way does it say that the earth was divided? Look one more time. So look at, <coughs> excuse me, verse number, I lost my spot, verse number 25. It says, for in his days was the earth divided. Now look back down at verse number 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these uh, were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So notice that. By these were the nations. It talks about by these were the nations divided. So what was divided? People were divided, right? So it's definitely not a reference to the earth itself. You notice that? But by these were the nations divided. Then it picks up the story in chapter number 11. It says, hey, they're all together right now. And then what happens? God confounds the languages, and then they're all divided. They all go forth into these particular groups. Then the, the time goes by. So you know what that tells you is that at the time of Peleg, at the time of Peleg was when... Genesis chapter number 11, verse 1, took place. So that's where we're at timing-wise when you're following the genealogies. Peleg is, is living. In his days, what were the earth was the earth divided. And what does that mean? These were the nations divided in the earth. Right? You understand? So Peleg is actually who's living on the earth. Who, he may have been, I'm sure he probably was, was present that day when they actually went to go build the Tower of Babel. So that's what's going on. This is where the division comes from. This is why you always need to use the Bible as your authority. It's right in the same context. It's very self-explanatory, especially if you don't have a preconceived idea. There is no reason to believe else, you know, uh, to believe otherwise. I believe this is very clear. It's in the context. It makes perfect sense. He tells you, number one, in his days was the earth divided, and then he tells you that that means the nations were divided. Let chapter 11, verse 1, God divides all the nations one of the other key things is that nations is used there with tongues. Do you, do you, did you guys notice that? Verse 31 it says these are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues. So notice they're all speaking different tongues. Chapter 11, verse 1, and the whole earth was of one language. Showing that this is prior to that, right? So it's very, I think it's very self-explanatory. It's very easy to understand. Use the Bible as your authority. You don't need extra material, extra material. You don't need some, some extra biblical truth. No, we need the Bible is what we need. We need to get back to the Bible. We can understand the Bible, give someone an explanation. I love, I love when somebody just tries to explain something in the Bible, but not using, not, I don't love it for them, not using God's word. And then the answer is just so simple. 
And then you can just show them, like, because when it's simple, it's clear. That's why. And you can just show them, like, hey, look, actually, it's much easier than that. It's actually, look how clear. It actually tells you. It actually tells you why he's called the Son of God right here. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 35. I love when the answer is easy like that. I like the Bible being simple. I don't just want the Bible to be hard. You know why people want the Bible to be hard? Because then they can have some answer that it seems like you don't have access to. That's why people try to like, you know, go back to the Hebrew or go back to the Greek. Because they want to act like they're more intelligent than you. That's not how the Bible is written. God is not the author of confusion. Every person in this room has equal access to all of God's revelation and all of God's truth. Amen. God loves everyone. It, you know, God does not just de you know, desire you to learn 50 different languages, all the ancient languages that are related to Hebrew. No. You have every truth right in front of you, and specifically in the King James Bible. Amen. We, everyone has access to these truths God is not confusing. The truths of the Bible are easy to understand. A lot of times, if it is super complicated, you're wrong. There are things in the Bible that are deeper, but almost everything in the Bible is simple. Almost everything in the Bible. And I'm stressing that. Like, 98% of the truths in the Bible are simple. God was manifest in the flesh. I mean, that easy, that simple. You got a verse to prove that Jesus is God? God was manifest in the flesh. The Word was God. Okay, the Word was God, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Almost all the truths in the Bible are just as clear as that right there. Amen. Proving that Jesus is God. Eternal security. Super clear. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Just by believing. But what, you know, what should I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's that easy. It's that, almost every single truth in the, in the Bible is that easy. It's that easy and simple. God, just, God did not write the Bible confusing. God did not make the Bible difficult to understand. God made the Bible very simple. And I'm thankful that God made it simple. And we shouldn't desire the Bible to be you know, difficult and, 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 and harder to understand. And a lot of times <clears throat> when people do that, it's because they want to manipulate you. It's because they want to have power over you. It's likened unto, a good parallel would be the Roman Catholic Church. They have everything in Latin because it's a language you don't speak. Do you, know, so you know what these people start doing? They start you know, playing with your mind and trying to speak a language you don't speak. And tell you, hey, let me explain that to you. You know, you actually got to go over here to this language, and then you got to, like, look up all this other stuff, the history books, and you need to study the history of Babylon and where it came from. And then they just go to this ridiculous... It's not the Bible, my friend. If I want to know about Babylon, I'm going to look up every time the word Babylon comes up in my Bible. Oh, that's boring to you? Then I don't want to talk to you about the Bible, buddy. I'm not interested in, in, in going to all... You know what? I'll learn history and stuff like that, and I am interested in things like that, but not when, not when it comes to the truths of the Bible. Right. That goes over here, my friend. The, the Bible goes here, and then the history book goes here. Right. And you know what? When this is right is when it agrees with this. Right. Right. That's the only time. Right. And you know what? If this conflicts with this, well, then this trumps this right. every single time. Amen. Every time. So the Bible needs to be our authority when it comes to any truth. Any truth... The Bible needs to be our final authority. And sometimes people can become overzealous, can't they? And their heart can be even in the right spot. But you know what? You need to always try to remind yourself in whatever place you are in, you know, thy word is truth. If I, it, you know, I started to have this thought about this and you're like, oh, hold on a minute. Did I get that from the Bible? And then back up. Oh, you know what? I actually heard somebody else say that. That's where I got that idea from. Well, then you need to go back to the drawing board. When I say drawing board, I mean King James Version. That's what I mean. You need to go back to the Bible and make sure that it's being derived from the Bible. Every truth that you believe, everything that you believe, needs to come directly from the Bible. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the King James Version. We thank you, dear Lord, when people try to confuse us, that the Bible's simple. You don't have to have you know, a college education. You don't have to be a theologian. You know, it's just so simple. We just go and just read the plain English words written on a fifth grade level. We love you and thank you for the King James Bible, dear God. We thank you for, for loving us and for giving us 
You know, all of this truth, a book that we could just continually study for all of our life. We thank you for even chapters like Genesis 10 and how we can just cross-reference words and just, again, how simple it is to learn your word. Help us to love the simplicity of your word and help us not to be caught up in, in everything, you know, being difficult and all of that. And help us just to work hard and to spend a lot of time studying what you gave us and not looking for extra truth. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.